The 2000s era will be remembered for many things. The iPod, Obama, 50 Cent being the most popular rapper at one time with not one but two video games. But what I as a loser who wastes his time watching cartoons and for some ungodly reason people watch it, the 2000s animation time will be partly known as the space where creators were looking at anime and letting that East Asian love spew all over the place. If you had a disdain towards anime within this time, good luck trying to watch a cartoon with some action or adventure in it. Avatar, Teen Times, Code Lyoko, America, Dragon, Jake Long, that one scene in the Chaos, Ben 10, Generator X, Boondocks, Mega 6 LR, Yu Yu Super Roman Team, Hyper Force Ghost, Hi Hi Puffy Yami, Totally Spies, Martin Mysteries, Three Delivery, and especially Kappa Mikey, which was like all the sweat and poor life decisions of an anime convention squeezed into one show. But at the request of one of my patrons today, I will be talking about one of Kids WB's Asian inspired cartoons, Shallon Showdown. Shallon Showdown was a show created by Warner Brothers Animation back in 2003 for the now defunct Kids WB block. It was originally on on the also dead Warner Brothers TV channel, the WB, which was replaced by the innovative CW. For you uncultured simpletons, this is where one of the most influential animated shows of the 2000s generation originated. Challenge Showdown's premise is about four children of vastly different ethnicities, backgrounds, and elemental powers who are in training to become Shaolin warriors. Clay, a Texas-loving cowboy, his character is basically the big lovable hick of the group, spitting his country gibberish sayings for pretty much any situation. Kimiko, the hot-tempered girl, always in style and into the latest fashion trend. And people call Post Malone a culture vulture, meet the OG cultural appropriator. I kid, but I do really like that one of her isms in the show is that she switches up her outfit majority of the time within the series. I like it. I wish more shows and characters would have multiple outfits. It's a nice touch. One of my details about Gravity Falls that I like. But some of her more experimental choices are pretty garbage. Don't you fucking ever come back to New York wearing this bullshit ever again. You take this outfit home. Are you burning? Raimundo, the stubborn street smart kid from Brazil. Pretty much the basic teenage boy with passions that are well suited to his age, like video games, cars, hot babes, bolt texting racism in YouTube comments, and soccer. He's kind of a self-centered sarcastic prick whose selfishness comes into play later on in the series, but more on that later. Dojo, the magical talking and cowardly dragon. He fulfills the role of comedy relief for the series and works as transportation for the characters. Think along the lines of Fu or that other talking dog from Juniper Lee, which those two shows are pretty similar in retrospect. But Dojo has way better lines and more memorable moments than any of them. And last character, a main focus more often than not Omi, a naive young boy whose knowledge doesn't go past the ancient traditional times. Kimiko, please, do not feel sad. I don't. I don't need your pity either. I was merely going to point out that you could not expect to do better as you are a girl. What? So much so, a consistent gag in the series is that Omi can't put together any commonly known phrases in the right order. As you might say, I smell bad. I stink, not I smell bad. I stink? Yeah, and you smell bad too. <laughs> a gag that is so funny, they use it in every single episode, and it never gets old. He's a stubborn, selfish narcissist of a character, but he has a good heart, and despite a lot of the moments where his ego is getting a little out of hand, you know that he means well. And together they fight the Halen forces, and stop them from achieving world domination with the Shengong Wu. These ancient and mystical creations with specific and dangerous powers that have put in the wrong hands and not used properly, destruction of great proportions is imminent. If two people are trying to obtain a Shengong Wu at the same time, they initiate what is called a Shaolin Showdown. In a Shaolin Showdown, two sides wager a Shengong Wu and one side declares what the challenge will be. And whoever wins these showdowns will reclaim both items. Ah, nothing like some good old childhood gambling. If I were to make a comparison to the show, I'd say that it feels like someone took like, man, I really love Bruce Lee, these Asian paintings, and just East Asia shit in general, but for real though, I'm really into these dumb Nick game shows. Throughout rewatching the series, I couldn't help but think about it. I mean, that's essentially what some of these showdowns boil down to at times. Some of them are just get out of the said maze or just a race between the contestants to the Shengong Wu or some really bizarre challenge like these kids shows. Except that at least in Shaolin Showdown, they actually fight each other, which is a flaw they fixed unlike those game shows, which were lacking in my desire to see high quality child violence. 
The showdowns are what we're really watching the show for, it's the freaking name. And some of them are these very creative and imaginative challenges with these cool environments that change for each and every one. A detail that I appreciate that they go through with with the effort of doing that. They could have honestly cheaped out and made all these showdowns sit in a preset and uninspiring arena and still get kids to watch it, but no. They designed new areas and didn't make it boring, and I'll call out that extra effort when I see it. Also, the Shin Gong Wu were also the main attraction for me as well. Another one of my favorite things in these cartoons around this time was the constant use of gadgets and upgrades that enhanced the user. Like other kids WB show, Jackie Chan Adventures. The Shingong Wu just have a really nice look to them, and some with some actual useful powers that I would use. My favorite one is definitely the Golden Tiger Claws, the Shingong Wu that allows the user to rip a hole in space and essentially transport in a way to anywhere they want. Powers are devices that allow the user to get to places faster with barely any effort or top tier. Listen, if Goku's instant transmission, the portal gun, and nightcrawler abilities were readily available, I'd take that shit on a heartbeat. I don't care if the side effect is 20 years off my life, I'd much rather lose 20 years and walk 10 minutes to 7-eleven. The Golden Tiger Claw is what I'm assuming to be a fan favorite and a favorite of the staff because one, they use it like a fuck ton. And two, I was expecting much more challenge showdown merchandise of Shengong Wu, but the only one I could find was the Tiger Claw. I mean, it doesn't look like it's that hard to design, so it's not too surprising, but I always assumed there'd be much more, like something like the Fist of Tebby Gong or the Monkey Staff, but no. I'm like, what the hell? You could sell so much bullshit merchandise for this series. You could sell the flip coin as an actual coin for at least $20 and some idiot kid would buy it. Actually, after recording this, I just realized I'm full of shit. You can get the Sword of the Storm Shengong Wu and possibly the flip coin. It'll just cost you a measly $500 to obtain, so it might as well not even exist at all. But what is undoubtedly one of the best things about the series is his primary antagonist, Jack Spicer. Jack Spicer is my favorite character because he's just so entertaining every time he's on screen. He's trying so hard to be villainous but fails because he's such a pathetic loser. He's kind of like Jared Leto's Joker except one is supposed to be funny. I think what really makes him stand out to me in this above a lot of the other characters is his voice actor's performance by Dane Cooksey. He just has the perfect mixture of cocky, arrogance, and wimp that just makes Jack Jack. He stands out the most to me because while the other voice actors in the series aren't awful, a bit questionable in some areas like making kinda higher pitched white Tom Kenny to play a Brazilian street kid in Raimundo. I'm not gonna lie, that was a little bit weird, but then again we're talking about a series whose mascot is a small yellow Asian boy, so not the most bizarre decision in this series. Do you just kinda sound standard in a typical affair from this? Them, like Grey Delisle doing her normal shtick. The only other voice acting performances that I would say are like standouts are like Dojo and Clay. And Clay's only on there because I think country hicks are just inherently funny. It's not your weight, it's how you throw it around. There's a lot of personality just spewing from Jack throughout the series, even through like little things like his mannerisms. And also having Wuya come in and just bust his balls is also a pretty enjoyable duo whenever they're on screen together. So, so far, it doesn't seem like there's too much to complain about with this show. The main cast are charming enough. The main attraction, the showdowns are fun to watch. The main villain, while goofy, is a riot whenever he's on screen. The art and animation is fine for the type of series, barring the constant use of these character animations whenever they would enable combat in the first season. Seriously, these were dumb. They like scream out their element and then the preceding fight doesn't have anything to do with it. I must insist you release him! Or what? Or this! WATER! Do you see a plane of water anywhere? Are you gonna use any water? No, you're just gonna use your fists? Oh. Well, that was kind of unnecessary. So, what are the negatives with this show? Well, when you have a ragtag team of one-dimensional but likable characters, the last thing you want to do is throw them into more serious stories and ah, fuck. Yeah, Challenge Showdown, whenever they introduce these very serious mini-arcs or continuous episodes, it doesn't turn out all that well every time, and the season's qualities begin to start varying the more it goes on. The first serious arc in the show in Season 1 slash Season 2, because they kind of blend into each other slightly, it's kind of weird, is alright at best. 
I don't really have too many problems with this one. My only beef with it is I feel like the show is kind of rushing itself to get Raimundo back on the good side too quickly for my liking. And I feel like Wuya being cucked out of her hot bod after she just got it back was kind of infuriating. Really though, I wish Wuya could have gotten more time in the driver's seat as the villain because she kind of just feels unimportant for a lot of the series afterwards and it's also kind of disappointing because the show isn't shy at telling you that Wuya used to fuck shit up way in the past too. It's like the Mysterio fight in Spider-Man 2 gone wrong. I'm not really laughing or anything and I feel a little bit let down. But it's not the worst one. A bit disappointing, but not terrible. For the rest of season 2, they introduce a bigger and badder character than Wuya, Chase Young. And what happens in this season? Oh, it's just the same fucking plotline and trying to lure a good-natured and good-hearted monk to the Halen side. Except you can't do that with Raimundo again because that would just be too repetitive, so it's Omi's turn. While it is basically the same, I will say this. I do think Chase Young's way of luring is much more interesting than Wuya going, Hey, Raimundo, you're mad at your dad, right? Right? Ah, that sucks, man. What do they know? You like pizza? You like video games? Chase's approach is much better because despite him being an evil tyrant, he has many things about him in the eyes of Omi that's worth respect in his intrigue. He's a great warrior with many things to teach, and Omi's big thing is that his ego clouds his decision making, and his want to be the best is kind of cancerous at many points. This one is actually pretty okay. I appreciate that in the season they use multiple episodes and see Omi and Chase's relationship slightly grow over time and their eventual team-up doesn't come off as too unnatural. Well, Chase did pull some tricks or shit in the end to make that happen, but overall, Season 2 is pretty alright. You still got the showdowns and the episodic episodes, and the serious ones don't shit the bed. And the finale of this season was actually pretty good, with another nail-biting cliffhanger that gets you pumped for the next season. But Season 3 is where everything in this show, in my opinion, starts falling apart. Continuing like in all the other seasons, the plotline before, only being evil in this case, blends into the start of this season, and the conclusion is one, terrible, but also wraps up quicker than anybody would really want it to. Getting the same treatment as Louie at the end of Season 1, Chase basically conquers the Earth and everything. And you could possibly expand this out to 5 or 6 worthwhile episodes, but no. Oh, we gotta return to like a episodic kids show on Saturdays. Sorry. But what pisses me off about this is just how the final battle goes. It is probably my least like showdown in the entire series. So Chase Young has basically won and the Warriors have one last chance of beating him in a challenge showdown. If you're like me, you're thinking, wow, this is going to be a pretty good showdown. I'm expecting some pretty satisfying action. <laughs> nope, let's settle the fate of the Earth in this high-stakes game of fucking soccer. Mars, what's wrong with this? They're allowed to make the challenge. Yeah, I understand that. If I was fighting some guy over the fate of the world, I would want it to be in something I'm good at, too. But it still doesn't make for an entertaining finale. It's just like a mess showdown with soccer with the most writing on it. Also, keep this in mind, if you're watching this in the original airings like me, you waited five months to see how this arc wraps itself up, and it's a fucking game of soccer. Needless to say, I was a little pissed at the time, and rewatching it again for this video, it still fucking sucks. But what else makes season 3 kind of a shit show is that it's kind of more of the same shit with nothing really new being added or brought to the series. So in every season, the Warriors get promoted to a new status or get some new gear. Season 2, all the kids get promoted to Shaolin apprentices. Raimundo is a little bit later because, you know, he kind of had that reckless shit with Wuya earlier, but he eventually caught up with everyone else. And then they eventually get like these ninja costumes and personally I thought they looked kind of bad and like the red geese more. In season 3 they become Wudai warriors and are given weapons and some are nice like Omi's water staff thing but some just feel ill suited for that user or just feel lazy. You give Clay the big fucking tank a small boomerang? I would think that something much larger would be more suited for the rough housing Texan. And you just give Raymundo a sword again which his weapon of choice was already a sword. Except this one is slightly different and is blue. And Kimiko's is the worst because it just sounds corny and stupid whenever she uses it. Oops. So those additions just feel kind of eh. 
And the new villain, Hannibal Bean, while humorous, I guess, he just kind of feels lacking in comparison to Wuya or even Chase Young. It's kind of like this, each and every year your dad got you the new iPhone or Android device, and one year he's just like, you know what, kid, I fucking hate you. Here's an iPhone 4. I mean, it's an alright device, I guess. But compared to what you had before, it's not doing anything substantially new or interesting. That's what Hannibal Bean is. The only thing that he contributed that was new is that he tricked Chase Young into becoming evil with some magical bullshit suit. That's it. And speaking of Chase, after he's defeated, his presence is just very awkward and just feels like he's just there. Like he had his chance in the spotlight, but because he was defeated, his purpose in the series just feels kind of gone to the end. Season 3's lack of any real innovation within the series for me just makes it kind of a slog to get through. And even the things that I talked about that were positive in the first two seasons, seasons like the showdowns they're still like the highlight of like every episode but i feel like they've done better in the past and on top of what season three does to piss me off is that they retroactively mess with one of the better characters and episodes in the series so rewinding back to season two for a minute specifically the episode where chase is introduced we are also introduced to another character master monk guan him and chase used to be good buds so hannibal being turned to amoeba with that stupid soup but anyways that episode is about master monk guan regaining his honor earlier in the episode, he betrays the Shaolin monks to help Chase steal Dojo away from them so he can continue being youthful because consuming dragons will keep him in his prime, I guess, in peak fighting condition. This is like a fact about Chase Young's character that he needs that does not get brought up ever again within the series. So, oh, all right. In return for giving him Dojo, Master Guan gets back his Spear of Guan that is very dear to him. The reason it's so dear to him is because he feels insignificant as a warrior without his weapon. After the Shaolin monks like confront him and go like dude what the fuck realizing his grave mistake the episode ends strongly with guan confronting chase young to make up for his betrayal and he ends up beating chase young without his spear of guan realizing it's not the weapon that makes the warrior it's the warrior holding the weapon and the episode also ends with him giving the spear that he felt was so important to him earlier as a warrior to omi in the end because omi was the one to help him open his eyes to that fact and is a sign of his gratitude towards omi for helping him it's a nice and sweet ending to this episode it's really good it's one one of the better fights in the series too like they changed up the art for this specific flashback fight with chase and guan and everything sure this is the introduction to chase young's stupid looking transformation like he's supposed to be menacing in like whenever he transforms but he just ends up looking idiotic but despite his stupid transformation it's a good episode of the series so how did they ruin it oh just guan has like 300 spears of guan in his tool shed out in the back so let me get this straight Guan, you sold out your friends for an item that you have over 300 of, you greedy rat bastard. Dojo is literally going to be cannibalized by Chase Young just so he can get your stupid ass spear back. You were the same guy the bitch and moan about someone stealing your holographic Charizard when you have 500 legit copies. The thing is, the ruining of Guan just feels kind of unnecessary, like there's barely any point to it. They just did it so they can make an unfunny joke and take a stab at Omi and take him down a peg in this scene. Which they already achieved that because in the episode, The Return of Master Monk Guan, he trusted Raymundo with the responsibility of tricking the enemy that he turned evil again, and not Omi or any of the other monks implying that Raymundo has skill sets that are greater than what they can achieve. I do not understand! You gave me the Spear of Guan! Well, it's not exactly the only one I have. <laughs> They're numbered. 384 is one of my favorites. Fuck off. He just kind of comes off as a goof. If the original spear was magical in any way or unreplicatable, then his actions make more sense on why he would want to betray them. But the fact that we know that he has multiples of the same exact spear just kind of makes his spear a less coveted item within the show's universe. It makes his gesture a little hollow in retrospect. Mars is about him regaining his courage back. All right, but he still sold out his friends to the most evil character in the series for a thing that he could make himself. Like they could have given a much more wilder reason for his actions that might have worked better anyways like guan get dojo and i'll lift the curse 
Go on, give me Dojo and your wife can go. Go on, give me Dojo or at least your internet history to the world. I, any of those would have been better than the transaction being, bro, I'll give you your spear back if you give me Dojo. But what if he made them afterwards, huh? But what about all that stuff about not needing the weapon? What, are we just gonna revoke that about him? Was it once he gave it up, he was just too embarrassed to ask for it back and didn't want to come off as rude? He didn't want to go like, hey, Omi, on further realization, I actually do need the spear? Can I, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Also, he has had time to make another one. The fight where he lost it was freaking years ago. He's just been sitting there like a sad puppy without his weapon for like years. Why not make another one? According to this, it doesn't seem that hard. And he doesn't even get the benefit of the doubt of, oh, maybe he was possessed or controlled by Chase Young. If that was the case, he'd be a cat. Chase Young turns all the fallen warriors he controls into cats because he's a dick. So that's kind of off the table. He literally just caused this conflict for the main characters for something he already owns or could just replace. The Spear of Guan is just a bullshit weapon. Wanna know what else makes no sense about Guan? He's like 1500 years old. The funniest shit about this show is just going to this show's wiki page and just reading up on what powers he has and the first one is immortality. Like they give Chase a somewhat reason for how he's over a thousand years old. Guan is just a brick shithouse that just refuses to die. Again, and Guan, you're kind of dumb. And just continuing the poor endings of these seasons, what do they do for season three? Time travel. You know when a series is not out of ideas when they do half-baked time travel stories. It's not the series' first dabble with it, but oh, their first, their first endeavor with it was way better than this. So in the series finale, Omi's still all about Chase Young and discovers the sands of time Shingung Wu, allowing him to go back in time and stop Hannibal Bean from turning Chase evil. But he has to wait till the Wu activates, and that could be like years or centuries. So he's like, I'll freeze myself into the future like the first episode of season two when we defeated Wuya, and then get it. But what he doesn't realize, without him, the Shaolin monks can't win and Jack Spicer becomes ruler and evil wins. I don't know how he didn't think that. You guys have constantly struggle with bad guys with you around, but this is only worth talking about, so I don't know. So blah, 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 blah. He gets the sands of time and he goes back and changes Chase Young to a good guy. But when you do that, a lot of changes happen. So now it's no longer Chase. It's my favorite. It's Guan's turn to be an evil antagonist. Realizing, oh, maybe it's for the greater good of humanity for Chase to become an evil villain. Omi goes back in time again and resets shit to his natural order making this kind of two-part series finale essentially fucking pointless. I mean, what does this two-parter really do to exemplify a lot of things that about the characters that we didn't already know? What, that Omi makes bad decisions at the risk of the team? Boy, it's not like there's been like constant episodes or like an entire arc about that previously that we haven't seen already. And his fuck up probably contributed to why he was not chosen to be team leader at the end of the series, so nice going there, buddy. I mean, it was pretty clear he was gonna win that fight anyways. What, you want Omi to freaking lead you right after carelessly destroying the universe? Yeah, no thank you. I don't think a guy who can't decipher the meaning between basic common phrases should be telling me how to combat evil. Clay's honestly too stupid and in a two-parter we saw what would happen if he led and was only able to accomplish planting corn. And Kimiko doesn't really have the leadership skills and a little bit too temperamental for that role. She's more better in a support role than anything else. Raimundo is the safest bet and despite the whole evil arc earlier at the end of season one, he showed the most characteristics of a leader than anyone else. And plus he earned it, especially in the finale. Like I dislike the finale and I think it's kind of stupid, but it is one of Raimundo's crowning moments in the show and shows why he's the most dominant monk. It was not Omi winning the showdown in the end, Raimundo won it. Omi and everyone else were just like vultures eating the scraps of a more powerful creature. Raimundo single-handedly bodied every main antagonist of the series in this last showdown. Wuya, Chase Young, Evil Guan, and Hannibal Bean. If you don't crown him after that, then this is the biggest crock of shit finale I've seen in a while. And seeing him standing there with his black gi with the flames on the side was the only satisfying thing about this final episode. And then the show just ends. Well, that was a pretty lengthy, annoyed rant on a show that I say I like. I'm like a strict parent with Shaolin Showdown. I give it shit, but I do love you. When the show doesn't have to delve into more serious stories and becomes just an episodic looking for ancient magical treasure show, it's fun. 
But whenever he gets more dark, continual episodes, it always concludes very poorly and unsatisfying, in my opinion. Do I still suggest it? Yeah, it's still good. It kind of runs out of mojo later on. The first two seasons still have some good ones in there. Season 3 is kind of a boring drag. But just when you think it's over, it's not really over, because for some godforsaken reason, there's a sequel to this series, Shaolin Chronicles. Listen, let's cut the crap. Shaolin Chronicles is awful. It disregards a lot of things in the past series that fans would expect from like Raimundo being the leader. The additional character Ping Pong just seems lazy and could have been given to a character that fans like like Jermaine which he's like the biggest cock tease in the franchise because he's always like on the border of like maybe I'll join you guys later and then he just never does. The voice cast is completely newt leaving Tara Strong on an island by herself. <laughs> Can someone rub my ears? The new older designs for the character just look awful. The showdowns the main attractions look bad being animated in terrible 3D. So the main thing and the most appealing thing about the show is the most unappealing thing about it. Way to go Chronicles. Way to go. I can kind of appreciate the series creator Christy Hugh for still wanting to continue her series. She seems to really want to keep playing around with these characters in universe and even making a failed kickstarter for a graphic novel series. But in my opinion I think the series should just be left alone. You know, just cut that bitch off. If she's ever gonna do like another action series, I'd watch it. But it's time for Shaolin Showdown to be put down. 